So today's uh, discussions will be in both uh, French and English. So if you are looking for translation, just in the back outside is uh, headsets that you can pick up. Channel one being on English, channel two being French. So if you wanted to grab those, and then we can conduct uh, the panel in both French and English. So feel free to grab that, and then we'll get started. Yes, I will. <laughs> so again, if you're looking for translation, in the back, um, there are headsets available as we'll be conducting the discussion in French, en français, and anglais, English. And I would ask at the end if you could please return those kindly so uh, Ottawa U doesn't have to uh, go out and buy more of them. So we're going to get started. And first and foremost, I just wanted to say uh, a welcoming to Algonquin Territory. This is unceded Algonquin Territory that we are here and we are gathered on, so welcome. Koi Kwe, Rodney Nelson, Indigenous, Nipsing Nindujaba, Makwa Dodem. My name is Rodney Nelson. I'm from Nipsing First Nation. I'm Bear Clan. And I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here as the moderator of this wonderful panel. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, bonjour Jamado for the morning and thank you to all those that are out there as well suffering this uh, torrential rain that we had and those that are flooded in their, in their basements. We're having uh, quite a time in Ottawa right now so my heart goes out to them and uh, I hope that they are all well and those that could be here are here. I wanted to say miigwetched Jamadot, creator, for bringing us here together. I also wanted to thank the, uh, the four-legged, the two-legged, those that crawl, those that fly, those that swim in the oceans, the lakes, and the rivers, all those that are around us in, in Mother Nature, who gives us this great bounty in which we, which we live upon, and we take care of in good stewardship. And I want to thank all of you for coming here and being part of this wonderful conference, and I wanted to give a, a special thank to uh, uh, Scott Simon for putting together this panel, and for everybody who has been involved in the organization, and uh, I'm glad to see uh, Donna Patrick's here. Hello, Donna. Nice to see you. Wonderful, wonderful to see you here. And so I'm going to, we're going to do a format in which I will introduce the panels. We're going to be talking a bit about movements. And so I'll give a brief opening introduction and then we're going to move on and I will introduce our panelists and we'll have a quick five minute each discussion on what they're doing today, what, they're, what they've been up to, as you will, take a pulse on sort of, you know, how they are, what they're doing in, in, in their areas. And then we're going to come back into a more formalized round of asking certain questions around uh, social movements and around declaration uh, of uh, rights and freedoms, and then of course we're at Canada's 150 now, and we're gonna look at it from an international perspective all the way down into, of course, state perspective as well, and from a Canadian perspective, or Canada perspective. And then later, then the next round, we're gonna, we'll probably move into discussions around anthropology in this area. 
I have to say that I'm, I'm holding a feather, these feathers, these are uh, Chief Dan George feathers. Uh, these are feathers that were given to my family and I just thought I would bring them out. Uh, there's a lot of teachings that go around feathers and when we bring out the feathers, um, we always say that if you're holding an eagle feather, you talk straight as the feather goes and it's one of our most sacred objects because the eagle flies highest to the creator. So it brings all our hopes and dreams but it also connects us to connects us to the, to the Creator. So I'm going to uh, lay the feathers down for now and just talk briefly about what we're saying. So two, 2017 ma marks the, hundredth, or the 10th anniversary of the UN Declaration of Rights in Indigenous People. 100th. Man, can you imagine what the conversation would be like if it was the 100th anniversary? It's also the 50th anniversary of the Circle of All Nations and on Algonquin territory, which William Commando was his vision that we all come together from all places, all nations, all people, that we are all of one blood and that we're all one mind. And it's the 150th anniversary of Canadian Confederation. The Report on Truth and Reconciliation Commission encourages us to confront our past, but also inspires us to look forward into, into new relationships and what that relationship would look like as a more nation-to-nation -nation based relationship. Questions of sovereignty then come up, questions of self-determination, questions about what would, that look, that, what would that look like going forward for our people and for the nation as a whole. And what are rights looking forward to sort of the international context and the declaration and what does that mean for, for indigenous people worldwide? I'm encouraged, and maybe I'm an optimist, is to say that I think we're at an unprecedented time in Canada where social movements have taken place. We had, of course, everybody uh, is, is talking about and heard about I don't know more. And then there's more that's happening across Canada and indeed the world about social movements to reconnect and to relook at relationships with Indigenous people to look at our traditional knowledge and to say the ways that we know are valid ways. And so I'm encouraged today myself to say that I think that there's a, an incredible grassroots movement of people that are wanting change. Institutions are making changes. And even the government has made changes within the Canadian context. And it's encouraging that Maybe there is a path forward that we can take, that we can look at for conciliation. So with that, I'm going to introduce our panel, and then I will pass it over to our panel discussants. So first, I have uh, Michael Ash. Um, he's from the University of Victoria. He's a political anthropologist with nearly 30 years of experience examining the relationship between First Nations and Settlers of Canada. His new book on being here, Treaties and Aboriginal Rights in Canada, presents fresh approaches to moving forward with Can Canada honoring the terms of the historic treaties negotiated at the time of Confederation. In 2015, he received the Canada Prize in Social Sciences for this book, and he's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and served as Senior Research Associate for, uh, for Anthropology on the Royal Commission on Aboriginal people. He'll provide a fresh perspective on how anthropologists can certainly contribute to truth and reconciliation, and of course, rights in Canada. So do I go from here? I'd rather... I'm just, I was going to introduce everybody and then we'll just... No, that's okay. <laughs> Irene Bueller is our next panelist. Senior Research Director at uh, CNRS, graduated from the Institute of um, Studies of uh, Politics in Paris and, and, and uh, has completed a PhD in Ethnology and Social Anthropology. Um, after her PhD on Gender Relations in the Amazonian Maihuna Society, she developed research on the anthropology of institutions. Her research on state and power led her to research international movements of indigenous people through study of United Nations structures in charge of Indigenous issues, to which thousands of Indigenous representatives from the whole world contribute. 
She does research at the UN in Geneva and New York, centered on dynamics of indigenous people's movement and how mechanisms of human rights, individual and collective, are taken in consideration in, dom in domains of world governance, such as sustainable development and climate change. She'll provide her reflections based on observations at the UN and on challenges of implementing the declaration within a neoliberal context. Irene Bielier's, uh, um is our next panelist. Oh, sorry, I'm missing it. I, I, I'm reading it in the wrong way now is what I'm doing, so. I realize I'm reading from this page and not this page, so. So, Carol. Carol holds a PhD in social and cultural anthropology from the Sorbonne and has devoted her entire career to Aboriginal issues. For over 40 years, she has been working closely with Aboriginal communities, organizations, and institutions in Quebec and elsewhere. Over the years, Carol has, uh, has experimented and developed several forms of participative and collaborative research in which the populations, individually or in community, play an active role. She has lived in more than 40 of the 56 American Inuit and Inuit communities in Quebec and has carried out numerous field surveys. The work proposes a conceptual and applied rereading of the logics of dynamics and the form and basis of explanatory argument that the logics and action of politics and programs for Indigenous people. She founded in 2001 and has since directed Dialogue, the Aboriginal People's Research and Knowledge Network. Our last panelist, Margaret Boucher, is, has, um, is an assistant professor in anthropology, associate professor at Penn Cultural Heritage Center, and coordinator of Native American Indigenous Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. An indigenous anthropologist of Abenaki descent, she specializes in museum anthropology, reparation research, oral traditions, and decolonization methodologies. Through critical study of cross-cultural interactions that shape collections, she has called attention to native contributors in the museum enterprise while unpacking histories of collected indigenous heritage. She also studies par paradynamic shifts in research and produces results from greater inclusion of indigenous people within the field. Landmark legislation in cultural property and heritage and increased attention to Indigenous human rights. As director of Wampon Trail Project, she conducts research in museum collections and with tribal communities, while developing restor restorative methods for recovering evidence of Indigenous artistic and historical traditions. So I'll pass it on to our first speaker, Michael. Do I go from here? Go from here, yeah. I, I think I want to go from there. Come on up, yeah, absolutely. <gasps> Thanks. Oh, yes, because this is an imposing room from down here. Um, and it's less imposing if I'm standing up for me, anyway. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to the territory and to this occasion. And thank you, Scott. Um, and I'm really happy to see so many friends here. And I welcome the opportunity to meeting some more of you if the occasion arises. Um, only have about five minutes, so I just wanted to start with a bald assertion and then see where we see how far I get. So it's self-evident, and if you don't agree, we could have an argument about it some other time, but you just have to accept right now that we do not have sovereignty or jurisdiction in Canada or the United States of America when it comes to the indigenous relationship. I'm not arguing that we couldn't make a claim in international law or something else that we have sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis Britain or any other nation state. But we do not have legitimate sovereignty and jurisdiction in the face of, and this is through our own legal, moral, ethical system. 
we do it through fictions, what we like to call, when other people do it, myths. And we have a myth of an exception that enables us to claim that there weren't people here as we understand them to be in political society when we showed up, or other reasons. I'm not going to limit myself to that. Now, in Canada, some of us have taught this for at least 30 years, and I'm sure the tradition goes back further. But the question, so I don't want to go through that. I'm just going to take it there. But the question that now is addressing some of us, it certainly is addressing me, is so what do we do about this? How do we deal with the situation? And in going through the book that uh, was mentioned on being here to stay, um, I had occasion to go through some of the history of this country from the settler colonial side. And I realized that one of the things that we have been doing, those of us who have been teaching this, have been over-determining the argument, not about the legitimacy argument, but have over, been over-determining the positioning of settlers vis-a-vis -vis this argument. As though until our generation came along and minus two, two generations before yours, and I'll lay it on my generation, um, everyone was a colonial jerk. And somehow we had the enlightenment moment of realizing that maybe we were wrong. But the fact is that these ideas have been around for a long time, the kinds of ideas that I carry around. And as I'll talk later, they're reflected in an anthropology that we've discarded. And what I'd like to see in terms of the anthropology is us to start rethinking our history that way. But what I'd like to see in terms of our relationship, which is what I talk about, is looking in that book, is looking at the treaties from the perspective of the way in which the indigenous peoples have described them. And there are certain treaties in which there is good evidence that the Crown's negotiators led, shall we say, led or joined with the indigenous peoples as an understanding of a sharing of the land. I believe, and this is not what they thought, but I believe that this is quite possible within an indigenous polity as I've come to understand it, not, notwithstanding the concession that they're the senior partners, they have whatever legitimacy we have to be here derives from the good relationships that we have set up with indigenous peoples. That's thought that has gone back a long way. So that the problem really is, to me, really is, not that we've never thought about this, nor is it that we got it right, because we didn't. We're always, you know, you have to learn. We have an arrogance of thinking we don't, but we have to learn. But that there was that intention, there was that possibility there, and we just have not had the political power to move that to the forefront. So I have been arguing in the book two things. One is, we can have a millennial understanding and a transformation, and I, you know, like a lot of you, I really hope for some millennial changes here. But we can't sit around and wait for that to happen. So what are the kinds of things that we can do right now? And I talk about one clause in Treaty 6, which most, most people don't know. And Treaty 6 is a treaty on the prairies done in 1876. And it's called the famine provision. And as it's described, and it's in no other treaty, and it was not in the treaty when it was sent out from Ottawa. Uh, the commissioner put it in after he heard what the indigenous side was requesting. And after he had heard them say, we will help you in times of need, it was a request to help them in time of need. And forgetting the legal language in which he put it in, as he described it to the population, he said, 
should anything, should a calamity happen to you, not what happens in everyday life, we will not let you die like dogs. That's actually what he said, and it's written down. And it strikes me that an easy first step is to insist that, interpreted today, we insist that our governments follow that provision. Why is it taking five years for water? Why is there this poverty? We are letting people, we are, we are the cause of creating so much of these people in that imaginary, I'm not being literal, in that imaginary dying like dogs. So that's number one. Number two, I'm suggesting if that doesn't hit people hard enough, and of course we're inured somewhat to those kinds of arguments these days, then the second one is we need to reframe the way in which we tell the story of Canada and move away from a story of our liberation as the good child of the queen as opposed to that bad American child who rebelled, slowly moved our way to independence and replace that with a story in which what's central is the relationship for good or bad that we have been establishing with the people who were here when we came and with whom we've decided to stay. Because isn't that more important to know about, for everyone to know about, than how we managed to become mature enough to leave some place we're never going back to? Thanks. Miigwech. Je vais parler en français, tel qu'on nous l'a demandé, puisque l'Université d'Ottawa est une université bilingue, semble-t-il. Alors, bonjour tout le monde. Merci, Scott, de l'invitation. Merci, Rodney, pour les mots d'introduction. Nous sommes en territoire Anishinaabe, ici. Alors, c'est un grand plaisir pour moi euh, d'être ici. Et comme on l'a dit dans la courte euh, biographie, euh, non seulement je suis une anthropologue depuis quand même plusieurs décennies, mais je suis aussi euh, une anthropologue euh, de terrain. Je fais la différence entre les euh, « chair anthropologists » et les anthropologues de terrain, c'est-à-dire que même encore aujourd'hui, euh, je continue d'être sur le terrain euh, pratiquement une semaine sur deux, ce qui est un peu fatigant parfois, mais terriblement enrichissant. Alors, si j'apporte ce volet du terrain, c'est que ça me permet, de l'intérieur des communautés, de faire une relecture des événements comme ceux, euh, celui de la Commission royale sur les peuples autochtones, de la Déclaration des Nations unies, sur les droits des Autochtones, dont on, on célèbre le, le dixième anniversaire cette année. Mais avant de parler de la déclaration, je vais retourner à la Commission royale sur les peuples autochtones, qui euh, a sorti son rapport en 1996, donc euh, son rapport final, donc il y a 20 ans déjà. Euh, quand on regarde aujourd'hui la Commission royale sur les peuples autochtones, en fait une commission assez unique euh, sur la planète, qui s'est déroulée dans les années 90 ici au Canada, euh, on a tendance à constater que ces effets ont été limités. Euh, Puisqu'il n'y a pas eu comme tel, et on va le dire de manière générale, euh, de prise de position officielle du gouvernement face à l'autodétermination des peuples autochtones. Alors on a tendance à euh, un peu dénigrer euh, cette commission et pourtant, cette commission euh, a mis au jour des situations qui n'étaient pas connues à l'époque et qui, encore aujourd'hui, sont passées sous silence, trop souvent, au profit d'un discours peut-être extrêmement euh, général quand on parle des peuples autochtones et un discours qui fait en sorte qu'on oublie les femmes autochtones et la Commission royale sur les peuples autochtones a pour la première fois de manière 
organiser, donner la parole aux femmes autochtones. Et si on arrive en 2016 avec euh, l'enquête nationale lancée par le gouvernement canadien sur la, la question tragique euh, des femmes autochtones disparues euh, ou assassinées, c'est bien parce qu'il y a 20 ans, lors de la Commission royale, on a reconnu la place des femmes. Premier niveau de distinction à faire aujourd'hui sous le grand chapeau de ce qu'on appelle les peuples autochtones. Parfois, à force de, de vouloir faire la synthèse, on oublie les constituantes. Et la Commission royale a permis aussi de mettre au jour une autre réalité, celle des Autochtones vivant dans les villes, les Autochtones urbains, comme on les appelle aujourd'hui, mais finalement, c'est un concept qui devrait être revu par les anthropologues. Néanmoins, à peu près 65 des Autochtones du Canada ne vivent plus sur les terres de réserve. La proportion est un peu plus faible au Québec, mais on parle quand même de 50 À partir du moment où on a 50 de personnes qui ne vivent plus dans les communautés, tout en gardant un lien avec les communautés, je crois qu'une question aussi fondamentale que le territoire doit être vue. Donc, deuxième facteur de différenciation qu'il faut considérer maintenant. Premier, les femmes. Deuxième, les Autochtones des villes. Et le troisième élément que la Commission royale a permis de mettre au jour, a permis de reconnaître, de faire reconnaître, du moins, même s'il y a encore beaucoup de travail à faire, le, la troisième dimension a été celle des savoirs autochtones. Non pas présenté comme étant simplement une parole, mais bien présenté comme composant des systèmes de pensée et d'action à part entière. Donc, il y a 20 ans déjà, la Commission royale, qui n'a peut-être pas atteint tous ses objectifs politiques, a permis d'amener à la conscience de tous et de toutes au Canada et ailleurs aussi, sans doute, mais aussi à la conscience des anthropologues, ces trois composantes majeures, les femmes, non seulement les femmes comme partie de la population, mais les femmes aussi comme créatrices d'organisations, de structures, d'institutions à l'échelle des communautés, mais aussi à l'échelle nationale et même internationale. Et ce sont encore aujourd'hui des paroles de ces femmes qui sont passées sous silence. Deuxièmement, avec les Autochtones dans les villes, phénomène très peu connu encore aujourd'hui à l'échelle du Canada ou dont on ne tient pas compte lorsque vient le temps de parler des traités notamment, euh, lorsque vient le temps de parler des grands enjeux euh, politiques. Ça, ça m'amène encore à reparler des savoirs autochtones et du rôle que peuvent avoir ou que devraient avoir, mais là c'est très personnel, les anthropologues pour la reconstitution, mais plus encore, euh, comme le dit... Euh, la chercheure maori Linda Tahuwe-Smith, la régénération de ces savoirs pour leur mise en contexte contemporaine, pour savoir dans quelle mesure on peut s'en inspirer, quels sont les mécanismes, quels sont les principes fondateurs qui sont à l'origine de ces systèmes de savoir, pour qu'on puisse aujourd'hui les réintégrer dans les politiques les programmes que l'on développe à toutes les échelles, au Canada, au Québec, à l'échelle des municipalités, des provinces, des territoires, du pays tout entier, que l'on développe de plus en plus. Il y a énormément d'argent consacré à la définition de programmes, de politiques, mais je crois que c'est notre responsabilité comme anthropologue de faire en sorte que ces programmes et politiques soient revus que les logiques d'action qui les animent soient revues à la lumière des façons de faire 
développés par les Autochtones en phase avec leur propre compréhension de l'univers. Et c'est à cet égard que la Commission royale, à mes yeux, a été presque un rendez-vous manqué pour les anthropologues. Et, mais 20 ans après, il n'est pas trop tard, d'après moi. Alors, je vais m'arrêter ici pour cette première phase. Ça donne un peu une couleur des autres éléments que je pourrai faire intervenir tout à l'heure. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Aloha, Azul, bonjour, buenos dias, good morning, Deo Besenyatagö, Kwei. Merci de me donner la parole, merci de cette introduction. Et la, la Déclaration des droits des peuples autochtones ouvre un espace pour remédier à la marginalisation des peuples autochtones, à la colonisation de leur territoire, à la négation de leur valeur, de la valeur de leur société et culture. Dix ans après, de son adoption, où en est-on Le bilan est assez mitigé. Euh, je reviens de la 16e session de l'instance permanente des Nations Unies sur les questions autochtones, qui s'est conclue hier à New York. Et euh, je voudrais évoquer un peu les, les derniers développements, mais ma réponse est, est informée par euh, ces recherches que je porte depuis euh, une quinzaine d'années, euh, des enquêtes de terrain aux Nations Unies, sur le mouvement international des peuples autochtones euh, pour saisir la nature des transformations qui euh, se nouent à partir de cette mobilisation qui s'accompagne d'une reconnaissance, d'une plus grande visibilité et euh, qui euh, témoigne aujourd'hui euh, d'une volonté de prise en charge de ces questions euh, au niveau international, au niveau global. Et j'ai dirigé pendant six ans une équipe de recherche euh, pour un projet d'excellence financé par le Conseil européen de la recherche euh, où nous avons travaillé sur les échelles de la gouvernance pour comprendre justement comment cette norme universelle que ça, qui s'appelle la Déclaration des droits des peuples autochtones pouvait être appropriée par les États. Et euh, le titre de cette recherche est assez clair, c'est « Les Nations unies, les États, les peuples autochtones, euh, les enjeux de la... Euh, » Enfin, le sens de l'autodétermination au temps de la globalisation, parce que c'est dans ces espaces-là que l'on se situe. Alors ce projet de recherche a, 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 a produit un, un certain nombre de, de, de livres sur les enjeux de la reconnaissance qui permettent de voir que euh, les questions se posent de manière extrêmement différente euh, d'un pays à l'autre, d'un continent à l'autre, mais qu'il y a aussi du commun. Euh, on a travaillé sur aussi les questions de terre, territoire et ressources qui sont véritablement le bloc difficile euh, d'appui de, euh, de la transformation à engager euh, dans la relation entre les peuples autochtones et, euh, et les États. Euh, L'un des problèmes majeurs, c'est que les peuples autochtones aujourd'hui sont situés sur des terres qui sont encore des terres, euh, disons, relativement protégées pour certains, certainement très réduites dans les cas des réserves, n'étant pas à la hauteur des territoires qui, dont ils ont été spoliés, mais qui ont été également des zones de protection, d'une certaine façon, lorsqu'ils ont été repoussés, ce qui est le cas en Asie. Et l'un des problèmes aujourd'hui, c'est que ces terres-là sont des enjeux convoités par les nouvelles entreprises multinationales, extractives, de l'agrobusiness, les nouveaux fronts de colonisation sont en train de se développer dans ces terres. Donc là, il y a un enjeu très fort. Et puis, on s'est posé aussi la question de l'éducation. Qu'est-ce qui se passe dans cette, La transformation de cette relation passe également par une problématique de l'éducation, la prise en charge de l'éducation. Donc ça, c'est un dernier bouquin que je vous montre parce qu'on l'a euh, sorti en février de cette année. Et puis après, on s'est attaché à montrer un petit peu dans quels espaces se situe cette interprétation des normes internationales. Et on vient de sortir euh, la semaine dernière ce bouquin-là sur les droits des peuples autochtones, des Nations unies aux sociétés locales. Alors, je dirais que d'une manière générale, euh, la déclaration des droits des peuples autochtones ne connaît plus d'opposants au niveau international. Il y a eu quatre opposants et ils ont changé de position en 2009 et en 2010, le Canada, l'Australie, la Nouvelle-Zélande et, et, euh, et les états unis Donc maintenant, il n'y a plus d'opposition, mais il y a des problèmes d'interprétation. Et on tombe aujourd'hui dans ces espèces de creux 
qui font que, sans opposition, les choses parfois ne bougent pas. Le Canada est aujourd'hui un État relativement euh, en avance par rapport à toutes ces problématiques, désireux de pouvoir transformer les choses, mais il est très en avance. Vous avez la Chine à côté, qui est radicalement dans une autre position, ne serait-ce que parce qu'elle ne reconnaît pas la notion de peuples autochtones, qu'elle attribue simplement aux États colonisateurs européens, et donc à ces États qui ont été construits par la colonisation européenne. Alors, moi, j'aimerais qu'on aborde dans cette discussion trois grands points, euh, qui relève d'une part de cette euh, dynamique que j'observe aux Nations Unies, qui est que l'espace autochtone a été, euh, se consolide euh, aux Nations Unies à travers les différentes institutions qui traitent de ces questions, l'instance permanente sur les questions autochtones, le mécanisme expert sur les droits des peuples autochtones, le rapporteur spécial sur les peuples autochtones, et qui finalement commence à euh, se saisir d'un motto ou d'un slogan qui euh, est important pour les, dans le mouvement autochtone international aujourd'hui, qui est que plus jamais sur nous, sans nous. Euh, ça, c'est un point important. Évidemment, on a ces problèmes d'échelle qui sont posés et euh, il faut réfléchir à comment est-ce que ça se passe. Est-ce que c'est au niveau local, véritablement, comme le dit euh, Carole, ce qui est important Est-ce que c'est au niveau national Certainement. Mais il y a aussi le niveau régional qu'il faut prendre en considération, les cours interaméricaines qui ont des effets, les systèmes régionaux des droits de l'homme, par exemple, comptent. Alors, dans cette perspective-là, euh, on se pose la question, enfin, moi, je me pose la question de comment euh, ce langage du droit qui va amener, à un moment donné, à définir des droits, définit également un espèce de fétichisme du droit. Le droit, ça fonctionne comme un un univers flottant dans lequel tout est susceptible d'être résolu par le droit. Ce n'est pas vrai. Le droit est quelque chose de vivant qu'il faut mettre en avant. Les droits s'articulent sur des choses très précises il faut, dont il faut se saisir. Euh, le cadre général de réflexion au niveau, disons, de cette mobilisation, c'est que euh, la question philosophique, par exemple, et très politique de la domination n'est pas inscrite dans la Déclaration des droits des peuples autochtones. La question de la colonisation, elle est évoquée simplement dans le préambule. Donc, euh, c'est tout à fait important de voir qu'aujourd'hui, euh, avec ces différents droits qui sont définis, il faut rentrer plus précisément dans des domaines très sectoriels, très particuliers, au, qui permettent, disons, de réfléchir à la transformation nécessaire dans les institutions, dans la gouvernance et dans la relation entre les institutions propres de gouvernement et les institutions étatiques de gouvernance. Et là, on, on, on rentre dans ce problème de la, euh, des dynamiques transformationnelles du mouvement autochtone. Ils ont réclamé des droits, maintenant ils veulent les voir appliqués. Donc maintenant, il faut qu'ils mettent un pied dans ces éléments de, de, de la gouvernance. Et ce n'est pas tellement facile. Euh, notamment parce qu'aujourd'hui, au niveau international, ce n'est plus tellement le cadre des droits humains qui fonctionne, c'est des cadres, disons, euh, autres, tels que les objectifs du développement durable, l'agenda 2030, qui va définir effectivement cette nouvelle logique de plus personne ne reste derrière. Donc les autochtones doivent rentrer dans cette logique de plus personne ne doit rester derrière, mais comment ils le font et pourquoi ils ont été derrière n'est pas véritablement euh, adressé. Et donc là, on a un glissement du politique vers les choses techniques, techniques, les indicateurs, la mesure, etc., qu'il faut commencer à faire. Et euh, un des points qui est extrêmement important à, à, à signaler aujourd'hui, c'est que dans le cadre de ces transformations, donc j'ai parlé des ODD, des objectifs du développement durable, il y a aussi les cadres du changement climatique. Et ce qui se joue aujourd'hui aux Nations Unies, c'est le statut de la participation des peuples autochtones aux affaires qui les concernent. Les peuples autochtones ne sont pas les ONG, ils ont, des, ils ont signé des traités, ce sont des, ils ont, de manière très différenciée dans le monde, puisqu'on parle quand même de 370 millions de personnes dans 90 pays, euh, certains ont des gouvernements propres, d'autres ne les ont pas. Donc on a les enjeux de reconnaissance de ces différentes institutions, de cette immense diversité qui va venir se heurter à l'organisation relativement simple du monde des Nations Unies en 193 euh, pays avec des observateurs, qui, des, des, des organisations intergouvernementales. Et là, on a un problème d'articulation aujourd'hui dans les formes de la représentation, de la mobilisation au niveau régional. Et puis, je voudrais qu'on aborde un tout petit peu la question de 
qu'est-ce que ça veut dire que le droit des peuples à disposer d'eux-mêmes Que veut dire cette redéfinition de cette formule du droit des peuples à disposer d'eux-mêmes en droit à l'autodétermination Self-determination, autodétermination, libre détermination, on dit en espagnol. Et donc là, on a une réflexion sur le soi, le propre, le libre, la liberté, et un problème d'articulation entre la question de savoir si ça se porte sur le niveau collectif, mettant en défi les États, les formes structurelles des États, souveraineté politique des États, respect de l'intégrité territoriale qui constitue les piliers du droit international, ou si ça se joue à un niveau plus intime, plus réduit, pour pouvoir avancer dans l'affirmation du propre. Voilà euh, euh, ces points que je voulais évoquer en signalant encore deux éléments qui me paraissent très importants. La question de la reconnaissance des peuples autochtones euh, est un véritable reste central. Donc, beaucoup de pays ne veulent pas parler de peuples autochtones, indigenous peoples, pueblos indígenas ou autres, peuples en petit nombre. Donc, maintenant, on a une espèce de glissement. L'Asie, par exemple, ne reconnaît pas les peuples autochtones. L'Afrique ne reconnaît pas l'expression de peuples autochtones. Ils sont tous autochtones, disent-ils. Donc, il y a un effet de renomination qui est très important en termes de communautés vulnérables, communautés marginalisées, populations. Et là, c'est des enjeux très forts parce que euh, dans la question de la vulnérabilité, toutes sortes de populations sont adressées là. Euh, lutter contre la pauvreté, les intégrer, tous, et les autochtones, là, risquent de perdre un peu leur spécificité. Et là, on a des enjeux très forts à regarder. Et puis le point final, ça serait que on s'occupe un petit peu de la, de, la, de, la, de la question de l'État qui est centrale dans cet objet, mais qui est en voie de transformation profonde. L'État, il est à la fois euh, confronté à une transforme, l'État en général, malgré ses différentes formes, qu'ils soient fédérales ou unitaires, il est confronté à, un, à ces défis de la reconnaissance de leur diversité intérieure par les migrations ou par la diversité intérieure autochtone, quelle qu'elle soit. Mais elle est aussi, ils sont aussi confrontés à, aux, aux moyens d'agir, avec face à eux des entreprises euh, qui sont euh, très fortes et très actives dans euh, le développement de nouvelles relations pour pouvoir extraire des matériaux et développer euh, des, euh, des logiques, disons, d'appropriation de, 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 euh, des euh, terres et des ressources. Et face à cela, au niveau international, on a des problèmes extrêmement importants qui sont que, par exemple, euh, lorsque des, les États ne défendent pas leur, ou ne reconnaissent pas leurs propres peuples autochtones pour poser des conditions de respect des droits humains et d'application de la déclaration des droits des peuples autochtones, alors les entreprises mères venues d'autres pays sont fondées à faire à peu près n'importe quoi avec ces, euh, ces, euh, ces, ces peuples ou ces communautés locales. Et c'est dans cette, ce noyau-là que se jouent de nombreuses luttes et à partir de là que se pose la manière de penser le droit à l'autodétermination sous une autre forme qui emprunte un autre vocabulaire qui est celui du droit au consentement libre, préalable et informé et des pratiques de consultation qui doivent être mises en place. Je voudrais m'arrêter là. Merci beaucoup. We're just going to set up um, a, a presentation. So here, we'll take some questions. We will, for sure. So just to make uh, my panels leaving me, they're going to the comfy seats. <laughs> Uh, well, I was just going to say that we could pass around and we can uh, 
um, talk a bit more about, uh, maybe have some questions on some of those comments. Some really good comments that were brought up around self-determination, governance, uh, that you know, is particularly interesting, especially from an Indigenous perspective, uh, and also recognition, especially trans movements of Indigenous people in different territories. And so what does, what does that mean and what does that look like? So maybe I will invite the panel back up here. I know you're just getting nice and comfortable, but uh, we'll start off just uh, a couple of questions to you about um, the, the, the idea of self-determination and rights of, of Indigenous people, and especially, as you were mentioning, not being recognized in certain areas, especially Africa and, and in Asia, but also in, in areas where that idea of traditional knowledge and traditional governance isn't recognized even within the Canadian and, and, and even the, within the United States context. So the idea between behind self-determination and moving forward in that relationship uh, with the state or even under the, the declaration, how do you think that we would move and be able to apply that and look at that within the sort of a future type context? So. Je pense que euh, les, si, 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 si j'observe ce qui s'est passé, j'ai assisté à la négociation des droits des peuples autochtones et donc je suis l'affaire la, depuis donc 2000. Et je vois que sur cette question de la reconnaissance proprement dite, les choses avancent de manière différenciée beaucoup plus vite en Amérique qu'en Afrique ou en Asie. Et elles avancent cependant en, en termes de reconnaissance de, des, des peuples comme des nations propres, ayant une existence antérieure à celle de l'État, ayant une capacité à pouvoir réclamer des, euh, des, des, des logiques d'organisation distinctes de celles de l'État. Dans les autres pays, si je prends le cas de l'Afrique, euh, il existe un, un, un mécanisme intermédiaire qui s'appelle la Commission africaine des droits de l'homme et des peuples, qui va, à un moment donné, essayer de faire l'interprétation entre ce qui se passe au niveau international en termes de reconnaissance de ce que seraient les peuples autochtones et ce que les États sont capables d'accepter en termes de poids politique, de disposition, d'équilibre politique à l'intérieur de leurs espaces. Et c'est là que... Euh, cette notion de communauté vulnérable, de groupe marginalisé, doit être à un moment donné acceptée, parce que sans dire la chose, sans dire les peuples, on sait de qui il s'agit. On sait qu'au Botswana et en Namibie, on va désigner les San ou Bushmen, les Himba, les Hereros. Euh, on sait que, euh, euh, parce que la Commission africaine a fait ce travail de médiation, le, la, en particulier, ça désigne les peuples qui sont, euh, disons, avec des économies de subsistance euh, non industrielles. Donc, les euh, chasseurs-cueilleurs, les pasteurs nomades, les, 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 les pêcheurs. Ce travail a été fait et permet d'avancer d'une certaine façon. Et l'on voit des transformations agir par la pression des demandes euh, d'une part, et d'autre part, par la, euh, euh, la manière dont les cours vont régler un certain nombre de conflits. Le cas en Doroys, au Kenya, Kenya, est en particulier important, comme vous avez des cas dans la Cour interaméricaine des droits de l'homme. Donc là, ça va permettre d'avancer. Au niveau asiatique, c'est bien, bien plus compliqué. Et cette, ce travail de médiation, d'interprétation de qui est désigné par pour faire telle chose, est portée presque intégralement par le mouvement autochtone seulement. Donc vous avez des organisations type euh, Asian Indigenous Peoples Pact, euh, qui, est des, qui développe des des, ses, ses travaux sur 14 pays, euh, et, et qui va à, avancer pour médiatiser. Mais là encore, on, on est obligé de travailler avec les catégories légales existantes, parce que les, peuples, les, les États ne sont pas décidés à progresser sur ce plan-là. Donc tout cela va contraindre la reconnaissance des droits à l'autodétermination, bien évidemment, parce que euh, vous avez ici des avancées dans le, dans le continent américain en termes de reconnaissance, par exemple, des espaces territoriaux, la démarcation des terres, mais vous n'avez rien de cela euh, en Asie ou, ou même en Afrique. Donc il faut s'appuyer sur les différentes modalités possibles pour pouvoir avancer.
Thank you for that answer. Thank you for welcoming me here. I pardon for putting you into the dark, but um, or I beg pardon, I should say. There, there we go, but we're trying to get it so the images are easy to see. Perfect. My name is Margaret Bruchak, Oleonim Malagit, and I am here to share with you some of the research I do with a project called On the Wampum Trail. So I'd like to bring this discussion down to the material level and into the deep history level and to really consider how salvage anthropology is part of the problem that we're talking about. Indigenous people have long been represented, misrepresented, and positioned according to how their cultural heritage is located in museums, which is why I titled this talk, Unfinished Business. In 2009, I was contacted by the Haudenosaunee Standing Committee to start doing research on a very contested category of objects called wampum. Wampum pig, from the Wabanaki word meaning white shell, is one of the most significant substances in constructing materializations of diplomacy, of diplomatic encounters and relationships. But in museums, it's often represented as inherently unknowable, unrecoverable, and somehow um, mysterious because these relationships are long past. And there is a widespread assumption among museum curators that it is virtually impossible to track the provenance of wampum belts beyond a few belts. That is patently false. I can tell you that as a, as a truth. But I can also tell you that there are more than 400 wampum objects currently in museum collections around the country. 400 wampum belts, I should specify. There are dozens of colors. There are hundreds of strings, and there are literally thousands of beads. Now, as I proceed with this image and these, this presentation, I would like to ask you not to photograph these images. I understand these will be distributed as part of the conference, but in some cases, I have limited permission to show them because I have access to so many sensitive collections. Now, to give you a quick history of human rights, during the 1970s, the Haudenosaunee efforts to try to reclaim tribal patrimonial wampum belts and museum collections directly led to the institution of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, which is why in that act in the US, wampum belts and Zuni war gods are encoded as iconic examples of cultural patrimony. The problem is that when those repatriations did finally happen, there was a very selective process going on in the museums by specific curators to determine which belts could go home and which ones would remain in the museum collections. So that is part of the unfinished business I'm talking about today. When those wampum belts went back, what was not accounted for was the fact that there were these very, very complex on the ground relationships, not just in the construction of the objects themselves, but also in the way that those objects had been conceptually as well as physically removed from the communities who created them. And in my research, I've now found that vast quantities of wampum are still circulating, but this myth that it's unknowable is part of what keeps them inaccessible to tribal communities. Now, the work I do is with museum curators, with tribal knowledge keepers, and it's a non-invasive study, so visual and verbal, so to speak. I talk with and around and over the objects and collections. And what I try to do is get away from this exoticizing, this fetishization of wampum, because many museums, even the Museum of the American Indian today, the National Museum of the American Indian, still continue to hold these objects up as these strange items of mystery. So the wampum trail became what I call a restorative research project. And to be very explicit, what I mean by restorative research is more than just decolonizing, but it's really reframing, so I call it a multi-sided archaeoethnography, because I am tracking not only the processes of construction, not only the processes of curation, but also the discourse around how we talk about indigenous peoples and objects. And what I've found is that most of the studies of wampum ceremonialism, and this is true of studies of indigenous ceremonialism writ large, were constructed by anthropologists who were outsiders, 
who only had partial views of what they were writing about, and who in many cases created texts that continue to resonate in the present day. So to the effect that many indigenous people, when they stand up to reclaim history and culture and language, find that they have to argue with the ghosts of anthropologists long past, because those words continue to have meaning and continue to exert power over us and over, I would, I would argue, everyone. So what I mean by restorative methodologies in the way that I practice it consists of very specific approaches. So through object analysis, I find details that have been overlooked or misinterpreted or misrepresented, and those details often tell me a great deal about the hands of the makers and about how the objects themselves were constructed at a particular moment in time. In the archival research, I have a particular gift for locating documents that people swear to me do not exist. Private correspondence between collectors, um, secret memos between museum curators, uh, conversations about what we're going to do when those Indians come into the museum. And it's really interesting tracking this. And to be quite honest, I came back to academia late in life because I found that as an indigenous activist, I was literally powerless unless I had a degree backing me up. And so I have very methodically constructed this work as very sound research, and I'm extraordinarily proud to be at the University of Pennsylvania, since Frank Speck was central to so much of that attempt to preserve and also attempt to recategorize indigenous knowledge. What I call object cartography is quite literally tracking the collectors, which requires a great deal of travel. So I have followed trails to really absurd locations. There are many stories I can tell you if time permits. But most important, I think, is critical scholarship because we tend to presume that the genealogy of anthropological knowledge is a truism and can be built upon over time. But if that truism is built on what I call a sandy foundation, the minute you interject some indigenous water, things start to move and shift in very interesting ways. Now, I have found that as part of this work, I've been able to get some curators to open up collections that have not been well known. The Rock Foundation was created by Edmund Carpenter, who was a protege of Frank Speck, who was a protege of Franz Boas. It was set aside so it would always be separate and not subject to repatriation as a private collection. But in the present day, I like, I'm very proud to say that George Hamill works very closely with Ganondagon and the Seneca Museum to now make these objects from Seneca sites available to Seneca people. When I go into museum collections, I'm required to get permissions from indigenous nations in advance because I'm often looking at objects that have pending repatriation claims. But much of what I'm able to recover can resolve information for communities as well as for curators. And I'm deeply indebted to the many curators who have been so extraordinarily kind and gracious in letting me in. One of my research assistants, Lise Puyo, is from France. She is now one of my graduate students. And Lise has a remarkable ability to come at this project not being American, not being Canadian, not being indigenous. She carries a different kind of baggage, as she puts it. And that baggage enables her to look at these with a very sort of discerning European eye, but it also encourages people who are primarily Francophone to open up to her in ways they might not to me. And one of the most entertaining conversations we recorded was where an unnamed French curator who assumed that I did not speak French had a long conversation with Lise in my presence about your professor. She is indigenous. Does she believe these objects are alive? And Lise very wisely answered, she is my professor, and I am not at liberty to speculate about her beliefs. <laughs> now, one of the things that the objects tell me, there are many things that they tell me, and one is the degree to which they have been preserved, altered, recreated, repurposed. Here's an example of an early French alliance belt. This lives at the Canadian Museum of History just across the water. And this belt was created with two figures representing two nations, both with weapons that they had agreed to ground. It is one thing to hold up an ax and exert power. It is another thing to decide to ground that power and set it aside. If one puts down one's weapon, it is a more powerful gesture. However, at some point in the life of this wampum belt, some different set of allies took the ax out of one of the hands. And you can see on the far side that that was not simply removed. Those threads were cut. Those warp leather strands were cut 
so that axe could be removed, I would say forcibly removed from this belt to give it a different meaning. What I find particularly interesting is that there have now been three reproductions of this belt made by contemporary native wampum artisans, and all of the reproductions contain no axes, which is a really interesting message in itself. The material insights, again, I could go on at some length, I'm trying to do this as a quick presentation, but the material insights tell a great deal about how the beads, the belts, every little detail of these objects are constructed, and one of the most profound insights, and I'm moving fairly quickly, but I'm assuming you can read this fairly quickly, but one of the most profound insights for me is that wampum, what we call true wampum, historic wampum, is made from quahog and whelk. Purple beads from the hinge of the quahog, white beads from the central column of the whelk. The two mollusks live in the same environment. It must be fresh and salt water, so a riverine environment where there is a river flowing, and in order to get the best beads, the quahogs have to be at least 60 years old, and the whelk have to be very young. So there's a really interesting binary in the construction of these beads, the old and the young, the salt and the sweet. When beads weather, as they do over time, as the color starts to leach out of them in archeological context, they become more uniform. One of the major discoveries I've made in going back to these objects is finding that the drilling patterns do not necessarily indicate the drill, they simply indicate the skill of the individual and the width of the object that's being used. So there was a widespread understanding that there was stone drilling and then there were Dutch steel drills. That's a long conversation, but suffice to say, indigenous people have used whatever they could get their hands on to drill wampum and have been doing so for a very long time. In many of the belts, I am finding anomalous beads. Do you see the anomalous bead here? That's why I want the lights low so you can see it. There's a steatite bead in the bottom row there in the middle. I, at first, I had curators saying to me, oh, those were repairs, those were accidents, someone was leafing through a pile of beads and simply inserted the wrong one. Trust me, it takes so much artistry to make a wampum belt. You do not make that kind of mistake. You make that kind of strategic intention and placement. So, for example, many belts have a single glass bead in the third row from the top, there is a single blue bead. The French were falling over themselves in the 1600s to try to replicate shell wampum. Every type of glass and nothing quite made it, but it is rather beautiful. One of the most profound belts that exists is, was one created by the Huron-Wendake Nation in 1674 to give as a gift to the Virgin Mary, is now at Chartres Cathedral, my student, Lees, is at this summer, she is going to Wendake to meet with people. She will be visiting religious orders across Quebec. And what she's tracking is not just the history of this belt, but its construction because it contains glass beads that, again, we were originally told were repairs, but they are in the original weave. They only occur in the Latin words. They do not occur in the indigenous words, and they do not occur in the field of the belt and they are very, very similar to the beads that were being given to Native people, often in rosaries. And in the midst of this belt, there is a symbol that in wampum language we call the dish. The dish represents a place where everyone can come together and eat. It is a communal central gathering place, and I find it very interesting that this dish is composed of two shell beads, two white glass beads, and two dark purple glass beads. Many belts show signs of extensive curation and repair, often literally having been taken apart and put back together again. But what I'd like to sort of leave you with, and there are two more pieces I'd like to share with you today. One is these relational insights. Because I've found that in past generations, research on indigenous collections and with indigenous people was often conducted in a very um, confrontative manner rather than a collaborative manner. And the arguments were about knowledge and rights and ownership rather than about meaning and relationship. And so I quite literally enlist everyone I meet with as scouts in this endeavor. So if any of you happen to know anything about wampum belts in private or museum collections, please do tell me. And I find that when these conversations recur, changes happen in the way we think about these objects. So for instance, a few days before I came here, I was contacted by Kitigan Zabi and by the National Gallery and by Parks Canada because there are several wampum belts associated with the 1701 Great Peace in Montreal. 
and one of them is coming to be displayed at the National Gallery, and so I've been asked to examine it before it goes on display. By engaging in these different relationships, here we're at the Canadian Museum of History again, I'm able to find that objects in one collection are often related to objects in another collection. Documents stored in one locale will illuminate material in another locale, and by encouraging those conversations, we end up thinking very differently about the past. We think differently about who these objects are, and I say who quite intentionally. Who they are, how they were created, how they are related to the communities that hold them. And one of the first successes of the wampum trail research is I was instrumental in having a wampum belt repatriated from one nation who had claimed it to the nation it belonged to. And in this case, it was a five diamond wampum belt that was returned to Curtis Nelson at Gnesetage, and quite poetically, it's one that was originally bought by Frank Speck and smuggled across the border in the 19 teens and then deposited in the Museum of the American Indian. So it took literally 100 years for that belt to find its way home. And there is a sister belt that was in the hands of a private collector and quite recently that has reappeared as well and that will be going home this summer. So wampum is in indigenous hands an object of living memory, in museum hands often a representation of a dead past and by bringing these communications back together in a more holistic way, we have the opportunity to learn a great deal more about not just wampum, but about relationships and how we can use what I call restorative methodologies to create better, better conversations and more in, informative conversations and better relations in the long run. And so I owe much of this work to my dear friend Richard Hill, who is at the Indigenous Knowledge Center at Six Nations Oswegan, who is quite literally the person who told me I had to go out there and do this. And so there you have the wampum trail. And I'd like to say to folks, feel free to follow us. You can stalk us on Facebook. We have a blog. We also have a blog on the Penn Museum site. And through this work, I hope to create a model for how other kinds of recovery and restoration might happen. Thank you. <laughs>